So what we'll do, um, both Adam and I had presentations for this, uh, this morning. We'll just I'll run through mine, and then we'll we'll, we'll put it in, see it after uh, after mall after lunch. So um, I uh, stepped back a bit from uh, just the work that the DGGS had done and said, okay, what, what's out there kind of in this terrain in Alaska and part in the Yukon uh, with similar geology and said, what have, we, what have we seen with airborne geophysics? And of course, there's a, whole, there's a whole range of other things. I mean, Mark mentioned, you know, Max Min, it's one of the tried and trues. There's, you know, bits of VLF here and things. And actually on that discussion, uh, I noticed in a, in a couple of other projects, I don't think I've seen the Max Min data there, but in a few other places, people have gone out with that with that technique, like Maxmin, which is a frequency domain EM system that's you know, found lots of deposits. It, it is sensitive to topography, so you have to uh, take uh, caution in, in, in the well. Let's say you, the people in the room, but your contractor has to basically make sure that they back out the effects of topography in that, because otherwise you you'll get spurious anomalies. But the thing that I saw. And I think it's in part the terrain here is that it, the lines were probably often, they had, you know, maybe had a showing and they'd stick a line down in it and they really wouldn't get far enough away from the actual showing. So the geophysical survey was, would, would be complex because you're, you have a wavelength in the data that if you don't get far enough away to see what the background is, it's very difficult to tell where the anomaly is. And I, and I saw a number of cases where these max min lines were too short, but it, you know, terrain, they didn't want it to cut bush, uh, time, you know, the rain, if you, you know, these things are electronic instruments, they're not really designed, they work great in the winter, you know, when it's dry, but they don't do well when it's really wet. So anyways, I think some of the techniques uh, probably, they're, they're okay, but if they're not applied properly, then you can get some misleading results. So anyways, one of the first ones that um, uh, found that had a bit of a historical record was up at Red Dog. Uh, we actually worked on a, a small, I think it was a heli geotemp survey. There was an owner of a piece of ground up there that sits inboard of the, of the tech ground, the Kamiko ground. And uh, uh, that was a few years ago, but this was actually a, a, an earlier airborne EM survey. It was one of the things that these systems, particularly the fixed wings, are quite expensive to move around. And I think there's, plus, given the terrain, there hasn't been as much fixed wing EM as there has been helicopter. Those are cheaper, and you often can, I'm not sure what they, they did during the, the 20 plus year programs, but they might have sourced the helicopter much closer, and then they just drive out the, the, that EM bird, the torpedo. Whereas the big fixed wing EM systems, it all has to go together. You can't really take it. So, you know, if they were flying out from Eastern Canada to Alaska, you know, that's, it's, Europe is closer, right? It's expensive. So they, they did this survey at Red Dog, and we actually got a contract um, from, from Cominco American. We were first starting a business to digitize some of this old data. We, uh, it wasn't a very satisfactory outcome, but I mean, it did, it does show that with that style of, of SEDEX mineralization, there are these anomaly picks, these zones in here, and they've represented the, you know, the conductivity. They certainly are within the area of the deposit. You sort of say, right, you know, the way they highlighted these, that there are features in here that are being picked up, semi-discrete bodies. Uh, so that style of mineralization does appear to have enough conductivity, even though it's, it's sphalerite dominated in Galena. There is enough uh, metallic sulfide to give a bit of a kick, um, and I think, you might know Adam, but I think they've done some resolve work, but more for geotechnical. I know there's been a presentation floating around that uh, Tech gave, and uh, I think it was to do with their tailings. So they've done recent airborne EM work with the frequency domain system, maybe at the same time as some of the DGGS work, to take advantage of the mobilization, but it hasn't been, it hasn't been resource directed. I think the depth of the mineralization here now, it pretty much is a, is a, is a, is a surface EM story. They, they're big fans of UTIN and stuff. But so, you know, one of the first major deposits you look at was pretty significant here, and the, the data was, 
is far more primitive in, in the past, many fewer channels in the time series. So that's the late time, and here's early time. And it's sort of like, yeah, we're getting some, some zits going down to, the, to channel four, which is good. This is the ranking that the input system, which came online in the early 60s, was actually able to map some of this stuff. Uh, mag, this is, you know, what do you say about that? It, this is the data of the day. Uh, trying to figure out the contours. There's, there's 25 nano Teslas and 50. So they're contouring, it looks like, to about five. Uh, is there anything diagnostic over the deposit? At this scale, it's probably too, we're in too close. If there was anything, I think I'd be much more comfortable stepping back two to three times and seeing what the data is showing. But at this scale, the concept is when you do EM, you may see a, a bump, and it shows up in those previous plots. But MAG is probably not going to be a bump. It's going to be some sort of structural setting, you know, some sort of uh, hoisting or something going on in the, in the geology that might be picked up with the MAG that says why the deposit is seeing where it is as opposed to the deposit itself. So MAG has, has benefit, but it's, it's uh, like the examples that Abraham is showing. You've got to be able to step back. Um, this I've jumped over to one of the early camps. Oh, oh okay, that's the next thing. Let's give me a preview. In the Faro District, uh, we're going to see some data later on today up in the, uh, in the, in the Howard's Pass, Tom, uh, Tom and Jason area, which is more classic SEDEX. Uh, so this, this is an interesting environment from, a, from a, both a geological as well as geophysical because we go from down in here, very traditional conductive uh, massive sulfide systems like plus 40 percent and these are real whoppers when you look at the EM response Wolverine, uh, Ketza River, um, Clear Lake goes in and these these ones in here around Faro are very strong EM magnetic features. Marge is, is much more subtle. These are far more subtle off in this part of the, the Southern Basin. Uh, Clear Lake is an interesting one in early time EM, very strong response, and nothing in late time. So it has a it has a has a geophysical response. They say, "Wow, what what what's with that?" One? I don't have any data for these ones down here, but we have a we have kind of a parade that will go around the Selwyn Basin, which is uh, fairly interesting. Here's the in the Faroe area, the Angorda and the Swim. These were all found, I think, back in the early. Early, early, early 70s, uh, some, and you know, the equipment then was far more basic, no GPS, um, they were flying helicopter typically, you couldn't fly fixed wing in the sort of rugged terrains in here, but they were certainly not of the fidelity that we have these days, but they still recorded some decent signatures, they presented the data a bit differently, here's contours of the EM response. And, and like Mark was showing, here's the deposit. You have a formational feature that hosts the rock package is much larger than the actual deposit itself. And that's one of the things, the mapping idea, mapping paradigm is something to, to watch out for in these. And you just say, well, there may be, you know, you don't usually give enough detail, but there may be zones of mineralization scattered along here. But the economic part of it, you know, sits in there. Something to keep in mind. There's the specs. It was a they called it a Lockheed or Lockwood Mark II helicopter borne system. There's some profile data. Uh, there's the mag. Mag's pretty diagnostic over some graphitic schists at the top. Uh, EM response in the middle. This was a ground EM technique that uh, the way it was operated allowed some uh, to uh, back out the effects of topography. Prone shootback, or JDM shootback, as compared with max min. It's not you can't get rid of it with max min, you just have to, it's a bigger effort. And then, you know, tip of the hat to the gravity story because that would be the sort of thing that I think the Heli Falcon would be able to see in a one and a half milligal type responses associated with the mineralization. But it's interesting, if you look at it, there was a question raised about regional effects and here, where the body actually truncates and you still have mineralization going up the hill, you actually don't have much of a gravity response. And that, uh, 
that to me is, a, is an interesting bit. Maybe maybe the mineralization is really focused on the point of, the, of that particular package, but certainly that's going to the graphitic schists are going to show up certainly in your EM. Another uh, example of some mag and, and, uh, and gravity responses. Um, that might, might have been taken on the ground as well. It looked like the same, same profile, so probably not airborne. But the airborne was used for the initial discovery in all of these. Contours, um, all of this was, this is probably, this is all pre-machined, so this will all be hand done, which was fun. That's how I met my wife, actually. Quite a few years ago, she was helping me make a ground magnetics map. But uh, the anomalies are quite clear. Even with the you know early the early systems, there's Ferro two, Ferro three. It's got to be Ferro one sitting up in there. So quite uh, quite helpful, quite diagnostic. Vanguard. To say the we're now like Mark Mark stuff and the others that Adam and. Abraham have shown we've gotten far better with our presentations. Uh, this is a more modern data set. This is a, uh, a helicopter time domain. That's one of, I think Adam said there were 50. <laughs> this is one of the 50. It's a good one. Uh, it's called the VTEM system. Uh, this is at the northern end of the Selwyn Basin. So we have a zone of, these aren't mineable deposits at this point. These, these are zones of significant mineralization. You're probably dealing with this, you know, I haven't looked at the recent 43-101, it's kind of, it's being parked right now because of remoteness and grades and tons, but you're probably looking at maybe half a million tons at one and a half percent copper and a couple percent zinc. Um, so mag up here, and then a uh, uh, EM, and then copper geochemistry. I'm not sure of the details on it, but there's, uh, it's interesting that the, the little cross for March sits actually to the east of the high on the, on the geochemistry. And there's that cross again. And, and the EM shows a feature. It seems to sit at the same location as that geochem anomaly. And the mag doesn't really show us a heck of a lot. There's a little, two little blips there. But, uh, you know, the mineralization, as best we could figure out, actually sits just to the east of that mag high, and just to the east of the geochemical feature. A um, little bit of a zoom in on this. So, um, mag in the upper uh, left, the copper geochem. So we've zoomed in now, we can see the center over here, and then that mag feature. So there certainly seems to be a correlation between the, the, the magnetics and the copper, but the actual zone of mineralization, which we seem to get a little bit of a tease in here, but then there's this annulus type feature here, as well as a high off to the to the west. So there's clearly some things going on that really haven't been nutted out. I mean, we're seeing a response at some level with that mineralization, uh, and I don't think it's necessarily the size of the mineralization, but it's got to be the style. Uh, and here's some limited geological mapping which doesn't really correlate much with the, with the geophysics. It's probably that survey was done and never used to make the geology map. The geology was probably done 10 years earlier, 15 years earlier, and then they did the, when they had the money, there was a huge amount of airborne work done in the Yukon in sort of the range of 2008 to 2010. What we worked for one company, very, very well known. They had 50 surveys and they had not interpreted one of them they had acquired in one year. It was just like, these are great hot dogs. Let's go at a whole bunch of hot dogs. We're not going to eat them all. So we went in and pulled a few of them apart. But then the problem was they were all directed towards base metals. And uh, gold became the king in around 2010, 2011. So lots of data, but not much done with it. Kutsikaya, I can pronounce that reasonably well. Very strong uh, ground EM, certainly if it had been flown. I think it would have made a, had a boomer of an anomaly associated with it. Uh, and again, this is, you know, down in the, in the southern part of the Selwyn Basin. Here's the magnetics with, uh, with uh, I think in this case, is actually horizontal loop maximum data. So the mag is the color, 
and you can see these troughs in the black is actually the axis. So a very close spatial correlation probably suggesting we've got uh, pyrotite or magnetite. The pyrotite could explain both the magnetic and the EM anomaly, uh, but that's a 58. It's about a 500 nanotesla anomaly. So that suggests that there may be some magnetite to me as well. Pyrotite tends not to be quite as frisky when it comes to magnetic response. This is the Clear Lake one. This is down in the, the southwest corner of the Selwyn Basin. That, both of these are an EM product. The one on the left is very early time. Here's the Tintina Fault. Um, Abraham is showing off his faults. Well, we all have our faults. So yeah, it's kind of like you see something, but there's you know it's not it's not something necessarily blind Freddy can see, but there's something going on in there. But this is the horizon that hosts the mineralization, and the little white bits those are the drill holes. So that you can guess where where the deposit is. This is a late time EM product where we're looking at the late time channels of the data. In the case of the frequency domain data, it would be the earliest or the the lower frequencies is sort of that's where the equivalent sits between the time domain and the frequency domain systems. But you can uh, see this area here pretty clearly is blue. The other thing to note when you look at the structure of the EM features at early time, you know, you got a blob here and some trends and along the edge of it. You go over to this one, you say, holy schmuckers, and what's going on? Layering. You obviously have a different set of geology sitting at the surface that the early time is responding to. The late time information is showing something much more penetrant, down maybe anywhere from 150 to 300 meters below the surface. So, but they never, you know, the focus was on this guy here, so nobody ever worried about remapping of the terrain. Here's a zoom in. There's an alpine we had at the mineralized equipment. They called it the Roar Horizon. I think there's about 11 million tons here. Five or six percent zinc. Uh, certainly, there should be sufficient drilling, but that's the early time response, and that's the late time response. And so, it's it's conductive, but it's it's subtle, and it's only going to be reporting in at, uh, at high frequencies or at early times. Mag. There's a Tintina. There was a number of other structures through the area. You know whether this one projected. Had any? That's a pretty hideous color. I did not. So I've joined the hideous color club. <laughs> not the only one. So definitely some maybe some parasitic ones around the Tintina, and uh, this one looks looks suspicious to, in relationship to where the deposit is. But you know, without without high enough grade, and the, given the remoteness of places like this, you don't get a lot of chance to to play around. Uh, this is the. Tom and the Jason deposits. One sits here, the other sits here in this package of highly folded rocks. This is, in this case, a, uh, a, an AFMAG, a ZTEM survey. Intrusives here are showing up as these blue or resistive areas. Very, very, they're mapped, and the, and the geophysics is highlighting them quite well. This is in an environment that people thought that the EM coming from the graphitic sediments, graphitic sediments in this package would basically nullify the value of any EM. But there was a question was, yes, in terms of specific target detection, but not from a point of view of mapping the geology and trying to understand the structure. Because that's what the, the, the people here now are trying to do is like, where are the depot centers in these packages of rocks? What are the controlling faults? What is the degree of offset? And um, so, they actually went in after this, and we'll, I'll show more of this after lunch. But these are one kilometer space lines. This is extremely wide space data. None of the stuff that Abraham showed us would, I think, be anywhere near that, at least not in the last 20 years. But it actually still has value if you have no other data, uh, both the EM in this case and the MAG, which I think the next one. Uh, this is an environment where when we, we went in and reviewed an, on another deposit called Howard's Pass, one of the 
the Chinese companies has, has Howard's Pass now. But a review had been done by a, a senior geophysical consultant for a nameless company. And he said nothing worked. There was nothing showed up over these deposits. It was all flatline, including magnetics, which of course is the cheapest and easiest. But that's the magnetics data. Trend up going through here, some sort of break. There's the other deposit in here. Lots and lots of character, but nobody really quite knows yet what it is because it's very difficult often to build. That vectorized bit here is the best guess uh, currently as to what the, what the geology is. So a VTAM survey has been flown over this, and they're going to try and nut out a bit further. Here's some sections. These are uh, DXFs of the mineralization, and we can see a, what appears to be a wedge of conductive rocks going off to the left. And the, and the, the reason this is up high is because the, these DXFs have them there on this line here, and there's a topographic difference when you look. There's the other deposit here, it projects onto there. So, you know, this could be the, the pay zone, terminates here just to the east. That seems pretty clear, that package, but here we have this wedge going off like this. And then maybe an intrusive sitting in there. So, kind of interesting from the point of view of helping direct some prospectivity. The Rao, the Rao in the early days was um, Archer Cathro's Great Hope in the northern um, part of the Yukon. But then, uh, I think it was through prospecting, well, anyways, they found the Osiris their gold zone, their, their Carlin analog sits at the back end, the e far east end of this package. And this, as they point out in their advertising, I think it's 180 kilometers long. It's a really, really big chunk of ground. But the flavor to the western part of this is definitely more base metal, although there's some, they've worked on a, what they call the Tiger Zone, which is a, a, looks like an epigenetic system sitting roughly in the middle. But the, the piece that Barrick optioned, or took a joint venture on, is that eastern part of it, which is a different story, also quite interesting. There we go. We've got the map here. Um, so Osiris sitting back off to the east, the Tiger Zone roughly here, and then the Rao with still good base metal potential, but no market whatsoever for that sort of uh, style of deposit. There's the march. So a lot, you know, it's an interesting neighborhood. There's lots going on. It's like Mark said, you need not just grade, but you need tons. So, big block of airborne time domain and Z10 data. Here's the tiger zone in here. They've run the numbers on this, and because there's a road close by, they think they may be able to put a limited production in on the tiger. The one off to the east is going to be far harder. Magnetics. You certainly can map the, the packages. Here's a magnetic body. There's the mapping. And the mag clearly shows that is a much larger feature. Um, I mean, there's a lot of outcrop in this environment, but there's also some very difficult settings in terms of seeing, seeing actual outcrop. So, um, and some and down in the valleys and the rest of it. So not surprising, the tiger has its anomaly and that continues off. These are showings. Moving discovered gold showing rock samples between one and 18.5 grams per ton. So, I guess this is part of the curse in this area that there's a lot of smoke, but it's hard to know how to get focus. And some spectacular terrain that they're working in, this being in the tiger zone, you know, there's a sort of probably 600 meters vertical relief. Uh, you definitely are fit if you're climbing up those, those ridges. And the, uh, the geophysics had its own challenges too, even with helicopter and flying. Not all pilots fly equally well in terrain like this, we found out. <laughs> Not all pilots fly equally well. Uh, very conductive package. So red here is the warm, the warm colors are conductive. There's the tiger zone in here. Uh, they actually named one of the zones after the survey, so they call that the Z10, and then the Puma, and another one up at the, in the northwest corner. And so uh, what they had was trend, which really didn't show up when they did the AFMAG survey, they had a trend that here with the EM that was quite compelling. 
that these zones are all falling along the structure, which really was not mappable in a coherent way through conventional uh, field procedures, or it would take too long. I mean, the season is pretty short. The snow, I think, starts in the middle of September up here. And they can only, it's only gone by the end of June. So time is, time is against them in environments like this. So any way to get a data set, you know, for a survey like this, would be probably $300,000. If you look at the cost of keeping the camp in and 25 people and a couple of helicopters and a couple of drills, you know, you've got a $3 million a year program for three months. So having, for 10% of that, having something to guide you where to go isn't such a bad idea. Cross-section through the deposit. These are the sorts of geophysical responses in section. They ran gravity. We had some susceptibility from the 3D model. So it looks like the minimization is up against the side of that, that magnetic lip. Uh, definitely some conductivity associated with it. Um, this one from the uh, VTEM and that from the, uh, from the, from the uh, ZTEM survey. Oh, OK. So we did, we worked out a deal. This was late in the piece, and we had a, this is where the Osiris Hot spot is uh, Ibis and the rest of them, and we had a piece of a ZTEM survey done here, way far off to the eastern part. So there was an area that was never flown. So we flew off to the west, which I showed you some of that, and then this area here, and this is the part. Here's the Catherine Lakes Fault. This is the part that Eric is now working on, and we did a an assessment of the of the ZTEM data in this area, and it's sort of like, whoa, very interesting. Uh, here's the mag, and again, another environment where mag doesn't work, thank goodness. So all these anomalies, just they're not real. Uh, the fact they correlate with geology is just pure happenstance. Um, but hey, you know, what I told them was if they, if they wanted to do one other thing in here, they should go in and do a stinger, high, low, res low elevation, high resolution mag survey, and I think they would they would really benefit in terms of the structural story here. Uh, things are a bit deep, but remember, too, like further to the west, this is a big ridge, and we're talking about something, a difference between the valley floor to the top of that of seven to 800 meters. It is a really honking good topography. So um, these are a bunch of 3D models that we created. And you're just by the drill holes here in, in pink are have to be a proxy for mineralization. So there's a, a cluster here, a cluster here and here, and these are this is a con, uh, this is a um, um, conductivity model. It's the RTP of the mag. It's the um, 100 mid frequency for the aft mag survey, and this is the um, slice of the, of, the, of the magnetic model. So we can see, uh, actually no, this is the contours have been superimposed on it. So it's both, this is both, the, the color here is the EM, and the black contours here are the mag. It's not, the, the next one will show it better, but the point here is that we see this sort of structural box that seems to envelop the zone of mineralization and say, well, we don't necessarily understand what it is, but it seems to have a profoundly sympathetic relationship to the mineralization. And what does that mean? Does that mean a drillable target? No, but it might really help you understand where to go next if you're looking for another one of these systems. So we broke it down into a variety of pieces. We turned it over to them, uh, but they, it came in a time when the market, even though they had a deal with Agnico, the market would not let them do anything adventuresome. So they'd go out and they'd do a minimalist program, I think starting in 2014, and it wasn't until Barrett came on the scene that they now got some new cash to interject with some new ideas. And Barrick wanted to fly, I'm not sure if they did, but they were going to fly Heli Falcon with this, which was very, probably the most ambitious helicopter survey that that system would have ever done if it's been executed there. God bless them. Hope, hope it works out. The mag. Some very, very good correlations with map faulting, but it also showed some extensions which uh, had been, we call it, missed. 
uh, for reasons that were, were unclear. Um, the pink lines come from, from that mapping that the, the, the Yukon Geological Survey went in, and they actually did a very intensive program in this particular area. So asking some interesting questions. There's the three, that's the 3D mag model sitting in here, it's a zone zoomization. So you have this, something similar to what was showing up with the, with the Z10EM, some sort of primary structure sitting down about a kilometer below the surface of the Earth. Shows up in EM and shows up in MAG, with zones of minimization right beside it. So go figure. It's not targeting, but it's certainly idea generating, which is, which is often a critical part of where to go next, because that's the problem they have. They don't have enough here to basically make an economic story. Um, so they need to understand the mineral system better than they do, which hopefully they're advancing with Barrick's budget. And I am out of time, and I'm going to uh, wrap it up. we we'll break for lunch. We've got an hour, and then we're back with Mole, and then we'll get Adam's half hour presentation right after that. So. There she is. Okay. No, it's all. It's more. This is the whole thing. We got release of this because we did it. No way. I think that we got paid. Observations. They're the fundamental ones at this sort of scale. Uh, we're seeing stuff that the geology um, is complementary to the geology, but it's often very difficult to reconcile what it means because often. When a, when a geologist maps a structure at surface, there's really usually very little three-dimensional information present. It's a trace. Whereas the geophysics is often telling us more about not just where, where the trace is, but what's going on at depth. And at depths that are often we never even drill. I mean, you know, two or three, the MAG and, and the ZTIM data sets are, are sensing down a kilometer and a half or two kilometers the way we image them. So we simply have a portal into 3D geology that we, we still don't know really what to do with. We're still trying to figure out what, what it all means. From, but if you're thinking about a mineral system, that's the package, that's the neighborhood. That's the neighborhood that this thing grew out of. It just didn't arrive in a meteorite for Pete's sake. It was huge amounts of fluids, compression, dilation, things that leave footprints. They have to. These are big events, even if the actual minimization is, for us, you know, sort of a small head of us. I mean, you, you listen to, you know, you go in to read about how these Carlin deposits formed, and it was, you know, enormous amounts of fluid motion. And we see it in the geophysics. We just don't quite yet understand how to take the, those regional images and translate them into something. There's that, there's that big Kathleen Lake fault. Why is the gap here? What happened here? Nothing in the mapping. Just goes right through. You say, well, there's something different. Something happened. Something probably cuts through. The thing is, we don't have a lot of data to basically give us the perspective that you need. And that's where doing these regional surveys is so important because you can, you can take that helicopter view, that stand back view, and do arm waving that actually has, makes sense. So, okay. There we go.